Hello and welcome to Young Money. I'm Nozi Pombandra. Now, oftentimes we hear of the phrase, the future of work, and how artificial intelligence and automation and machine learning are going to be replacing all the jobs that uh, humans do in the near future. Well, one young man who is certainly ahead of the curve and is living in the future, he is the founder and the CEO of Data Profit. His name is Daniel Schwarzkopf. He's here to talk to us about what the future of retail, the future of manufacturing, the future of financial services, the future of business really looks like on the back of AI and machine learning. Daniel, thank you very much for making the time to join us. We've been so fortunate on uh, Young Money of late to be getting South Africans who are doing amazing things around the world. And I know that you oscillate between the US and South Africa, but maybe just tell us a little bit about your journey as a businessman and an entrepreneur and what you're currently focused on at the moment. I started out uh, pretty young. I mean, as, as far as I can remember, I've been uh, involved in some sort of entrepreneurial activity. Um, when I was at university uh, studying chemical engineering, I came up sort of my first real business, which we raised venture capital for, mm -hmm. uh, from Alan Ott Craig and a, and a bunch of other guys. Um, and that was essentially providing, you know, free communications to people that was tagged with advertising um, and, you know, the advertising would cover the cost of, of the communications. And we had about half a million uh, registered users at, at the peak of that. Um, and then our staff uh, and the company was sort of acquired by Mixit. Mm. Um, and we all worked in Stellenbosch for a while. Um, subsequent to that, you know, I completed my degree because I took two years off when we raised the capital to go and do it. I went back, uh, finished my chemical engineering degree, and you know, while I was busy with that, I launched uh, BetVIP, which was the world's first licensed uh, Bitcoin sportsbook and casino. Mm. Um, so we worked on that for about a year and a half, and then a company uh, that I sort of met in a um, conference in Hong Kong around uh, iGaming Asia um, acquired it, CloudBet. And uh, subsequent to that, I started Data Profit, which is you know the venture I've been busy with on you know for the last three years, um, an artificial intelligence company. Mm. It was sort of first um, came about as an idea around three years ago, four years ago, when machine learning was going through a renaissance in terms of uh, the deep learning kind of revolution that's mm. happened uh, recently because of uh, the advent of GPU processing. So machine learning was first sort of meaning. So you have to educate us. GPU processing mm -hmm. sounds like a big word. What does it mean? Yeah. So machine learning was first meaningfully postulated around 70 years ago by Alan Turing. And it's gone through periods of favor and disfavor, um, mostly because the computing power wasn't available uh, mm. to service you know, the algorithms uh, that were intentional, very uh, computationally intensive. So uh, recently, around 2013, um, NVIDIA and a bunch of other you know, graphics card companies, uh, they've developed um, sort of different ways to interface with uh, GPUs, which are the graphics cards of a computer. Mm. Um, but they're much better at the types of calculations that artificial intelligence requires. Um, so they're able to perform you know, those same calculations 10 to 100 times, 1,000 times faster than uh, what was previously possible with the CPU, the central processing unit. Uh, so, I in essence, um, a data profit, which is the company that you're focused on now, obviously you have a, a long history of, of doing, uh, or running entrepreneurial businesses from a very uh, young age. But if we were to focus on data uh, profit, my understanding is that you're using artificial, artificial intelligence or algorithms, uh, in essence, to improve business outcomes and to give value to your clients. Maybe give us a sense of the kind of clients uh, that you work with and the type of work that um, data profit and uh, AI in particular allows them to do. Machine learning is really powerful and it's being utilized in, in almost every industry. The, the kind of industries that are leading the charge are uh, retail, uh, financial services, um, such as insurance, banking and uh, manufacturing. So in terms of the products we develop, we develop products for manufacturing, retail, and uh, financial services. And for example, in manufacturing, that would be the prediction of defaults mm -hmm. uh, when manufacturing a part, and uh, as well as producing um, a set of um, operational variables which allow production to take place at the highest yields. Right, so you're increasing efficiency and you're increasing production outcome and decreasing defects 
in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in financial services or what's possible in financial services? In financial services, we can predict uh, whether somebody is willing, uh, is going to take up a loan or a product, uh, mm -hmm. the next best product to offer them after you have um, sort of already sold them something. Uh, we can predict the amount that you should offer somebody uh, in terms of giving them a loan mm -hmm. uh, before they will become a sort of defaulter. Uh, so there's an optimal point to find out for a lot of these things that, that we can calculate. Um, mm. And it's quite powerful. So in terms of machine learning that w for insurance and financial services, that would be you know, sort of developing underwriting algorithms, um, take up algorithms, um, and basically everything uh, right down to the media optimization plans of, right. of companies like that. And, and retail, Daniel? So retail would be something interesting like uh, basket prediction. So mm -hmm. you can basically predict uh, whether you know somebody will purchase something in future what they're going to purchase and you know using this information you can incentivize them uh, with offers that will draw them back into the store mm. you can identify the anchor items and what's uh, you know going to really pull them back into your stores and uh, use that to sort of facilitate um, you know, promotions. Mm. So, so let's talk a little bit about retail because I think this is so fascinating. As a person who sh probably shops more than they should, do month end sales work or are there any other interesting, you know, insights and learnings that, uh, you know, machine learning has been able to uh, bring into the retail space that makes retailers rethink how they do their sales? For example, if you go to the US um, and you look at a company like Whole Foods, yeah. uh, the way that they set out their shelves is, is all determined uh, through data science and machine learning. Um, the way that they put different products at different levels of eye line um, and just essentially where they place them in the store to, mm. you know, um, because they know customers who buy X product will also buy Y product, so they place those two close, close to each together. other. Yeah, so that you know you minimize the distance people need to walk and, and increase their basket size. So the next time I see a sale, I'm going to think of you and I'm going to think about all the ways that uh, AI and, and data science is trying to mess with my mind so that I can buy more. But let's talk a little bit more around one of the biggest fears about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, you hear people saying, well, there'll be no jobs in the future and uh, all of this machine learning is going to take away all the jobs and this unemployment is going to become a huge global phenomena. What are your thoughts on that? It's one of my favorite topics to discuss. Um, I think people need to accept that um, the notion of a job is kind of an outdated notion and you know in 20, 30 years time we, we may have to um, move on to sort of a new system uh, where everybody gets a basic income or the government taxes robots that are performing these tasks that were traditionally sort of uh, done by humans and distribute that income to the people because right now jobs are already starting to be replaced by AI mm -hmm. sort of in the next five years uh, call center agents for example will probably be replaced completely a lot of the jobs that are um, sort of rules based in nature yeah. like accounting law uh, medicine even um, you know the components such as surgery and not not so much the components where you have to deal with human interaction with mm. there's empathy involved but the sort of rules-based learning, knowledge-based components of those mm. traditional professions will probably be uh, entirely replaced. I mean, that's fascinating. I mean, earlier this year, I was moderating a conversation on the future world of work at the ILO in Geneva, and exactly what you're saying, that the future that we're headed into is actually going to see a lot of jobs that can be automated becoming automated. And if governments aren't ahead of the curve, uh, we are going to have a huge problem. But one of the ideas you've put on the table is, well, let's have a big pot uh, of money or a fund uh, with where if you're using robots you're contributing to that fund and then that and then everybody gets what one would call a universal income. Mm -hmm. um, do you think being in Africa, uh, being in South Africa, that this is something that is within reach for our governments on the continent? I think it's something that governments will have to start focusing on yeah. instead of um, focusing on just trying to create jobs for the sake of having jobs. Mm. It's a very difficult and, you know, sort of very fine line to, to walk at the moment in terms of, you know, providing somebody with a job just because, you know, it will earn them an income and some sort of reason to, to work. But if a machine can do that same job, you know, yeah. much more efficiently, um, it's, a, it's something you, you really have to grapple with um, philosophically uh, in terms of you know, Dan Daniel, I'm so fascinated by this conversation. I mean, if, if, if we just go back to when data uh, profits started, uh, what was happening in the world that made you realize that this is the business that I need to build now and this is the business that is going to be not only relevant but 
um, invaluable in the future? In the academic world, uh, deep learning was going through sort of a, a big revolution and um, data sets, so there are sort of these benchmark data sets which people run tests on prediction tests and try and improve the accuracy. And around 2013, um, there was the biggest jump in you know, 30 years. Um, you know, the, the percentage of accuracy went up you know, 30%, 40%, uh, whereas previously this was you know, not even something that you know, could feasibly be, be done. Um, around that time, everything was very positive in, in terms of AI, and it still is, and it's a massive growth industry. Um, I think around that time was when people started to realize this is something that's, that's going to really change the world. And as Andrew Ng says, you know, one of the founders of, of the pioneering um, courses in machine learning, he says, you know, artificial intelligence is the new electricity. It's going mm. to be ubiquitous. It'll be everywhere. It'll be in every industry. Um, and you can see a lot of these examples in your everyday life. You know, if you log on to Facebook, and you see your friends being auto-tagged in pictures, that's because Facebook has used machine learning to develop you know, a 3D image of your friends' faces so they sure. know what they look like from all angles um, just because they've seen a couple of photos that you've tagged of them and yeah. used that to build a 3D model. There's also a lot of fear, though, around uh, s uh, some of the capabilities of AI. And as you said, auto-tagging is, is probably one of those things that fall into that. Do you think that as consumers, uh, and, and just ordinary people, we have caught up with, the, with what AI can actually do and are we comfortable about the world that we are hurtling towards? Because we're not even, it's not a distant future, AI is here and we're living it already. Are we ready? The best thing uh, we can do right now is f familiarize ourselves with machine learning and really understand its capabilities. Uh, we should educate the public and everybody around exactly what it is able to do. Um, businesses should start you know, using it more, especially in South Africa where we're a little, a little behind. Um, but in terms of the, the end user, um, the person on the ground, uh, they really need to work, you know, sort of develop a plan for the future mm. in terms of their job. Mm. What um, are your views on Elon Musk and his takes on AI? So he's uh, developed some really interesting um, sort of agencies that are planning to regulate and develop sort of codes of ethics for, mm. for AI uh, to prevent some sort of disastrous uh, Terminator sort of scenario where there's this uh, malicious AI that, that mm. tries to sort of control the world. Um, and we have to be quite careful around exactly how we develop these sort of AI components, but we are definitely years away from some sort of general AI mm. that can do something like that. Um, right now, we've gotten really good at developing narrow AI, which is you know, an AI that is really good at one sort of narrow problem, such as playing chess mm. or you know, driving a car or something like that. Mm. But the kind of uh, general AI that you know, these sort of dark futures envision mm. um, is still a really long time away. Mm. Um, and we can plan, we have enough time ahead to plan for you know, sort of implementing all the fail safe so that something like that doesn't happen. So Daniel, very optimistic about the future of AI and of course how it then engages and impacts on our daily lives. It's certainly a, a very fascinating conversation given the fact that we are hurtling towards the fourth industrial revolution. And as you said, South Africa uh, is behind. However, the big question for us, of course, is what does AI mean uh, for business and what can South Africa do to catch up? We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, uh, Daniel is going to share a little bit more about what the future of business and the future world of work means and looks like with AI and machine learning as a key driver. See you in two minutes. Welcome back to Young Money. If you've just joined us, we're sitting down with Daniel Swashkov and he is giving us the 101 on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, if you thought this was higher grade, this is the show you need to watch because he's really deconstructing what does this mean for business? What does this mean for me on a personal level? If there's ever been a young man who's already living in the future, it's Daniel. Daniel, it's it. I mean, I'm getting an education of a lifetime uh, on this show. But it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, one of the statements that you made earlier is that South Africa is falling behind. How big is that gap? How, how much far behind are we than other countries that have embraced AI and machine learning? Um, in terms of the you know, leading countries, uh, you know, the US, Europe, um, we're probably three to five years behind. Um, 
South Africa needs a lot of market education and we're more of a conservative country, whereas you know, countries like the US, uh, if we do a project like um, in the US, it's already specced out. Mm. Uh, we already know exactly what we need to do. The client's you know, comfortable and aware of machine learning. Whereas in South Africa, we kind of have to start with what is machine learning before yeah. we can even get to you know, what it can do or you know, developing some sort of idea for a client. Mm. And of course, you're engaging with corporate clients and, and I would assume that their big question is, how does this add more value to me uh, and for the business? But just broadly, as a South African, do you think that AI within schools is something that we have dedicated enough time to, to make sure that we are building a pipeline of, of South Africans who can operate in a world where automation and artificial intelligence is the norm? That's a really Im important question. Um, so governments and universities need to really focus on developing more courses uh, focused on data science and machine learning right now. There are a few pioneering courses that you can sort of attend in South African universities now and the graduates are just sort of, sort of uh, starting to filter through in into the market. So we should see some really positive changes in the future. Mm. Uh, right now uh, the s skills are extremely scarce. Yeah. A lot of the graduates you know, in machine learning and the related fields in South Africa come from overseas. And, and of course, um, being also being based uh, in, in San Francisco, you're able to compare very much what's happening there versus what's happening in South Africa. If you could give advice uh, to the government, uh, to business in South Africa about how do we begin to catch up meaningfully, what do you think uh, we need to do? Really embrace machine learning. Um, hire a chief data scientist, uh, get involved. Um, look for companies or partners that can give you the scale and experience to, to really put these machine learning solutions into place for your company. Mm. I think right now um, the best thing for a company to do is to really investigate, really put some effort into you know, going after these sort of machine learning goals as opposed to just um, having it as sort of some vague board objective where people will say, okay, we need to look at machine learning, but really to have a pilot project really get something going. Mm. There's also, I think, sometimes this idea that if you start thinking about AI and big data and just data science in general, that you're talking big business only. You're talking the big banks, uh, you're talking about the big uh, retailers, maybe even the big manufacturers. Is there scope uh, and need uh, to start uh, bringing AI into smaller to medium-sized uh, businesses and have you seen any examples of this being done well? It just depends on, it doesn't really depend on the size of the company, more around you know, the size of the data set. So for example, we're working with some charities uh, to predict um, whether people will default on taking their HIV medication. Mm. Um, and you know, obviously, if we can predict that they'll default, you know, there can be some sort of intervention, and they can they can change that and improve, you know, sort of uh, compliance with the medication. Um, there are sort of a lot of other companies we're working with, um, where you know the company might not be sort of a big corporate, but they've got a lot of data because yeah. uh, you know any company that's sort of existing on the internet, such as just, you know most startups, will have a lot of data, mm. you know, relating to their product. Mm. I mean, I love the fact that there seems to be. Um, a very clear correlation with developmental impact as well uh, when you begin to use uh, AI. So for example, um, the, the, the example you've just given us now about working with an NGO that can predict when people would default on their medication. Which other areas do you think AI could really deliver um, social impact and development impact that perhaps governments across the continent should be thinking about? Uh, access to finance. Yeah. So that's something which has been correlated really highly with um, sort of being able to start businesses, uh, being able to sort of generate a, a meaningful income. Uh, we find it that uh, you know most countries in Africa do not have some sort of credit history system. Uh, so what machine learning can do is use you know your uh, perhaps your cell phone M-Pesa type wallet mm. system yeah. and develop a credit score from that or develop it just from your uh, bank transactions. Mm. you know, coming in and out of your bank account. Mm. Um, and, you know, that would be one example that I think would be pretty important, you know, access to finance. Uh, my, my worry about African markets is that uh, data pools are usually very thin. I think we're not very good um, at, at just keeping data and maintaining uh, data. And, and one would just then assume that maybe that's the starting point where we, we just, we, we take care of what we have. Yeah, I think... Um, a lot of the work involved for us in Africa at the moment 
is um, preparing people's strategies for, you know, how to implement machine learning in future. Yeah. So a company might, uh, you know, come to us and ask exactly what should we put in place and what data should we, you know, save right now to ensure that, you know, in six months, 12 months time when we have enough data, we can use machine learning. Mm. So that's, that's a big component of it too. Um, you can't uh, just expect people uh, to know exactly what they need to record or in, in which way or if yeah. they need to record some sort of randomization um, in the data. Uh, and plus, of course, the data needs to be usable uh, um, at, at a later stage. I think we spent a lot of time with just uh, sort of getting into your brain and, and helping you to uh, explain to our viewers what AI is and what it can do in the business space. But I want to know, Daniel, what's the most exciting thing for you right now? What do you see on the horizon that you think this is where the future is going, uh, you know, beyond just AI? This, these, are the, the, these are the players or the, the areas that I think are most exciting. Well, there's a sort of a global battle around self-driving cars at the moment. Um, Every manufacturer is trying to get in on it, and Tesla is leading the way. Um, and I think in terms of the biggest real-life impact that we're going to see in our you know, sort of daily existence is, is going to be the, the advent of, of all these driverless cars. Mm. Um, you know, lots of jobs in terms of you know, professional drivers will be lost, but it will come with the benefit of you know, saving lives as you know, a computer will never get tired or stressed. Or, and if they know the positions of all the other cars on the road, it'll, it'll be a lot easier and there'll be less traffic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that's something that's going to be really exciting on sort of the, the short-term horizon. And I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, short-term horizon, what, how many years uh, do you think that uh, this could potentially be a reality in a country like South Africa? Well, if you go to the U.S. right now and you, you can, you know, put your Tesla Model X on self-drive mode and you can go from, you know, sort of San Francisco to Los Angeles um, completely in sort of self-driving mode. Um, it's, it's pretty good at doing highways and parking and stuff like that at the moment. I think in terms of a country like South Africa where, you know, our infrastructure um, still lags behind a little bit, it might take a bit longer. Uh, around, you know, 10, 15 years in the U.S., you know, three to five years, I'd say that there'd be some major progress in having, you know, lots of self-driving cars. We have self-parking cars at least. So mm -hmm. maybe we're, we're, if you're not too good on your parallel parking, I know that some of these uh, models can actually uh, park the cars for you. So we're, we're, we're behind, but we, we could get there. Before we, we um, close on the conversation, I mean, I think we spent a lot of time just talking about the business and so on. But what, what keeps you awake at night? So what worries you the most about the state of the world uh, and the state of South Africa? I think my motivation for doing this is to, to see the future and to have some sort of hand in, in creating it. Um, I think right now uh, the best way I can go about doing that is you know, focusing all my time and effort on this company and, and the world's largest growth industry. Um, you know, people might have some sort of uh, opinions about capitalism, but one, one of the things that it is reasonably good at doing is allocating capital to uh, individuals who can sort of produce mm. unique innovations, uh, such as Elon Musk. We would never have had you know, a company like SpaceX um, or Tesla if mm. he did not you know, sort of manage to accumulate that kind of wealth to create you know, those businesses. Um, so I think in order to have any sort of real meaningful change on the, in, in the world in the future, you know, um, that's something which, which really drives me. So there you have it. Uh, if we're ever going to bring about meaningful change uh, in the future, it means that we've actually got to embrace the future. And uh, Daniel is certainly living in that future. It's been a really exciting conversation, just really understanding the impact of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, not only in industry, but also the potential that it has for development. Now, if you want the Young Money Crew to come to you and you want to share with us your futuristic business, all you need to do is just follow us on Twitter. It's that simple. Follow me at The Real Nosy or at CNBC Africa. Remember that our hashtag is YoungMoney410. Until then, it's goodbye. <laughs>